morning. It is great to see you here at our uh, March 29th, 2020 a.m. service at the Independent Bible Church of Duryea. I'm going to have uh, a word of prayer, and Shane is going to come and lead us in song. Father, thank you for the opportunity that you've afforded us to meet together. We praise you for your kindness in allowing this to happen. And we pray that you will bless each of our folks. We're asking that you will uh, help those, my Heavenly Father, who uh, are uh, sick, uh, those, my Lord, that we even know personally that are ill, some hospitalized, some have uh, not within our congregation, praise the Lord, but some that we know have contracted the virus uh, and are in grave danger. We pray that you will minister to their needs even today. Now we ask, Lord, that you will help us to have a mind to worship you and thank you for each and every one that has come to church today via Zoom or via Facebook. We pray that you will help us all. Now we pray that we can sing into, uh, to your glory, even there in our own living rooms, bedrooms, studies, wherever we might be, and that we might glorify thee together, even though we're apart. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Shane? Okay, what we're going to do this morning, we will sing uh, two songs. We'll sing the two stanzas of each, first and last stanzas. And if you are home and do have a hymn book that you would like to follow along, as some have requested to mention from the Majesty Hymn Books. First one is going to be page 495, and it is the song, Count Your Blessings. Um, the second song that we'll be singing right after that will be number six in the Majesty Hymn Books. I'm sorry, number seven, rather, in Majesty Hymn Books, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. So we'll start off with 495, Count Your Blessings. Hopefully you don't even need a hymn book. When upon life's pillows you are tempest-tossed When you are discouraged thinking all is lost Count your many blessings, name them one by one And it will surprise you what the Lord hath done Count your blessings, name them one by one Count your blessings, see what God hath done Count your blessings Name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God hath done. So amid the conflict, whether great or small, do not be discouraged, God is over all. Count your many blessings, angels will attend. Help them come forth, give you till your Seven in the songbooks, number seven. Come thou fount of every blessing. Come thou fount of every blessing. Tune my heart to sing my grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing. All for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious song. singing at home you know if you were by yourself you could probably belt it out and nobody would care except maybe the dog puts paws over its ears 
but uh, we trust that you uh, were, were trying to sing along maybe as a family. Uh, I have a couple of more announcements before we go into our message this morning, and that is that if you'll take a look at our uh, IBC website, uh, thebiblechurch.org, um, you will see that there are a couple of site changes that have taken place there to help us uh, with communication and some of the things that we have uh, been doing while we're in church through the church bulletin. For example, you will look at the church events side of the page and you will see that now there are monthly links for bi the Bible reading plan uh, and that takes us out to the end of the year. Uh, there's also the weekly memory verse and as I work on that just a little bit more, uh, you're going to find that uh, the rest of the year will be there as well. Um, we still have sermons on audio. Uh, and those uh, sermons are archived, so you can go back. If you missed something online, you can go back. I know some people are having a hard time with Zoom, uh, and they may or may not have a computer to watch on Facebook. Uh, and so when they, uh, when they get their computer up and running, they can go back on our audio section and to begin to uh, uh, either download or listen online to some of our sermons that are there already. All right, that's... Uh, that's what we want to uh, announce to you. Let's take, a, take time to look at the Word of God this morning. Uh, and if you'll take your Bibles, I want you to turn to a very familiar passage of Scripture in the Old Testament. And maybe you have seen some comments on this verse uh, that people are sharing on Facebook or online somewhere. Uh, and uh, some of those uh, sharings of these verses uh, could be a little disturbing uh, because they might be lifted out of their context. Uh, we want to take what the Word of God has to say and apply the Word of God uh, because what people are saying is they're trying to link some things that are happening to the current situation. Others are trying to unlink some things uh, that are happening right now to our, uh, in our current situation to what the Scriptures have to say. Ultimately, we have to understand that God is in control of all things. We have to understand that, that when the Lord says something in his word, he means it. Uh, and so we uh, need to review what uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, 14 is all about. It's a wonderful promise. If you look at chapter 7, 2 Chronicles, verse number 14. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. That's the last part of a statement that he makes beginning in verse number 12, which we'll get to in just a few moments. Let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, Thank you for the opportunity that you have given to us to share the Word of God today. We pray that we might do it precisely, concisely, and Lord, that uh, those that are listening in might gain from this not only Bible knowledge, but conviction and comfort as well. Well, thank you, Father, for teaching us your good Word so that we might live for thee and we might witness for thee uh, under, under dire times that are happening all around the world. We do pray for missionaries that are serving you. Some, my Heavenly Father, are as locked down as we are. Uh, some, my Father, are in countries where there's a little bit more freedom. But we pray, whatever their situation, that those missionaries might take the gospel around the world. And we're praying for a message as it goes over Facebook, as it goes over YouTube later on, as it will go, uh, my Heavenly Father, across to Zoom and be shared, how we pray that you will use it for your glory, and that if one needs Christ as Savior, they might call upon your name. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Whenever a family or a city, a region, a nation falls under hard times, I think there are always those individuals that are out there who either blame God or they dismiss him altogether. I hope you're neither one of those. I hope you're one that takes what the Word of God has to say and apply the Word of God to daily living so that we might glorify Him. Um, 
I realize that there are some who are posting, as I said, these sentiments on 2 Chronicles 7.14, maybe 7.12 and 13 as well, uh, and they are going off on all kind of tangents. I, I, I don't want to go off on a tangent this morning. I don't want to point fingers. I don't want to shake my fist at the Lord. Some people want to do that. <laughs> I find it interesting that when atheists shake their fist at, at God, it makes me scratch my head because if, there's, if you say that there's no God, why are you shaking your fist at him? Why are you getting mad at God? Uh, that, that, that doesn't make sense. Uh, but if you're an atheist and you're listening in, I've got some news for you. There is a God in heaven. Uh, he made everything that there is. You don't have to take my word for it. Uh, you're going to realize this someday one way or another. You're either going to trust Christ as your Savior or... You're going to be one who stands before the God of creation, the God of very gods, and one day you're going to bend your knee and you're going to bow before him and acknowledge that he is the Lord. But till that time, you have opportunity while you have breath to trust Christ as Savior. And I pray that you'll consider some things, that God is involved in everything that is going on in this world. Let's take a look at this passage of Scripture. Is there scriptural guidance for us in the book of 2 Chronicles that we can glean for the moment that we're in? Am I willing to then accept what God says in his word about what I ought to do as an individual, as what we ought to do as far as a nation is concerned? My intention here is that I would be able to give from the word of God comfort, and also conviction. The two of those things go together. I know that my Bible says that God is the God of all comfort. But if I reject him, if I don't make him part of my plan, then I am divorcing myself of his action of comfort toward me because I will refuse to receive the conviction that he is trying to bring into my life. Is there scriptural evidence here for that? So I want to approach the word of God with caution and I want to ask the Lord to enlighten me and enlighten you as we open the Bible pages to understand what he has to say. This morning I want to <clears throat> divide this message up into three points as always. Number one, the occasion of Solomon's prayer and what we read as the answer to that prayer. Secondly, the ifs and the thens of this passage of scripture, of this matter. Thirdly, I want to look at God's response. Okay? First of all, the occasion here. Now, this is a lot of Bible study that I'm going to throw at you, so it's going to come out. <clears throat> it's not a drinking fountain, it's a fire hose. I'm going to cover a lot of territory by having you turn in the scripture because we have to establish what is going on here in chapter number seven. We just can't come to chapter seven and try to peel back the onion uh, to, uh, to, to try to gain some knowledge of why the Lord is saying this. Let me go back to some history of Israel. Come back with me to 2 Chronicles chapter number 1. Israel and King Solomon were seeking the Lord as one in verses 2 through 6 of 2 Chronicles chapter number 1. A little history before that. We recognize that Israel went back to the land and for a good number of years, it was a theocracy. That simply meant that through the priests and through the prophets, God was ruling the nation of Israel himself. It came to a point where Israel wanted to be like all the nations around them. And they went to the Lord, they went to the prophet, they went to Samuel and they said, give us a king, we wanna be like everybody else. Well, that's dangerous ground to be on. We want to be what God wants us to be, not what everybody else is doing. We want to be God's people. And so they rejected the leadership of God, and they wanted leadership of a man. Samuel gives them all of the details and says to them, now listen, if you go to an earthly king like everybody else, this is everything that is going to happen. He's going to have taxes. He's, you know, he's, he's going to want a military He's going to want uh, houses. He's going to want all the comforts of being a king. Are you sure you want to reject God? And of course they did. 
we know that their first king was Saul. Saul was a man after the people's own heart. Taller than everybody else, handsome. And of course, he ruled, and we know the trouble that he got in, and I don't need to rehearse that history. Next comes David, this little boy, this little ruddy boy, this red-headed, I think, freckle-faced kid is whom God chooses to be the king next. Of course, he is a man of war. He cannot build a house for God. He can't build the temple, but he has sons. And we know that there's trouble in his house because of his own sin. And of course, we have some of his sons that want to be king, but God chooses one to be king, and his name is Solomon. Solomon comes upon the throne. David has died. They bury him. They, they elect, uh, prior to uh, David dying, they elect Solomon to be the king. Solomon now is overwhelmed by absolutely everything there is to run the government of Israel. He is, and the people are now, engaged in something as we enter 2 Chronicles chapter 1. Read with me verses 2 to 6. Then Solomon spake unto all Israel, to the captains of thousands and of hundreds, and to the judges, and to every governor in all Israel, the chief of the fathers. So Solomon, all the congregation, in verse number 3, with him, went to the high place that was at Gibeon. For there was the tabernacle of the congregation of God, which uh, Moses, the servant of the Lord, had made in the wilderness. Verse 4. But the ark of God had David brought up from kirjath Jerim to the place which David had prepared for it. For he had pitched a tent for it at Jerusalem. Moreover, the brazen altar that uh, Baziel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, had made and put before the tabernacle of the Lord. And Solomon and the congregation sought to it. Verse 6. And Solomon went up thither to the brazen altar before the Lord, which was at the tabernacle of the congregation, and offered a thousand burnt offerings upon it. Can you imagine? So something big is going on. The tabernacle is there. The ark of God is going to be going to Jerusalem. And then God allows Solomon, after it's, he, is, he has made a wonderful sacrifice and tremendous worship service, God allows Solomon, think about this, to ask whatever it was he wanted. What if God put that on your plate tonight? Whatever it is you want, just go ahead and ask me. Would you think about it a little bit? Would you be selfish? Or would you think beyond your, your extreme want at, at that particular time. In verse number 7, And that night did God appear unto Solomon and said unto him, Ask what I shall give thee. Verse 10, I'm not going to read it. You read it. Look what it says. He asked not for riches, not gold, not silver, not fame, not fortune. He asked for wisdom and knowledge. It was the right request which, which received God's commendation. And you can read in verses 11 and 12. Plus, God not only answered that request for wisdom and knowledge, but God said, because you didn't ask of those other things, I'm going to give them to you. And so we find that God grants in 2 Chronicles chapter 1 and verse 12a, and I will give thee riches and wealth and honor. And for a fuller account of that, you can read 1 Kings chapter number 3, verses 9 to 14. Read it. Go ahead and read it this afternoon. You'll see how wonderfully God had blessed Solomon in that he only asked for wisdom and knowledge. Lord, give me understanding. And of course, Solomon used that. Well, we come along to chapter number 2 of 2 Chronicles. We find out that Solomon has a desire. 
In verse number one, it says, and Solomon determined, that word simply means that he had a great desire to do something. He desired to build a house for the name of the Lord and a house for his kingdom. So here we find Solomon then is, he's, he's expressing this to the Lord. He's expressing it to his cabinet. He's expressing it to the people. I want to build a house for God. He was engaged in building a house for himself. Why not build a house for God? So then what happens in verses 2 and 3 of chapter 2 of 1 Chronicles is Solomon dispatches stone workers, transporters. We would call them truckers and people who drive trains these days. Transporters. And, and when all of that business is going on, you need somebody to oversee what is happening. So he orders them. And then he goes outside of his country to Tyre and he requests, he makes an order for cedar to be brought in to build the house of the Lord. You can see that in 2 Chronicles 2, 2 to 3. A reason for doing something is always good when you deal with the things of God. And, you know, we, we don't go about things helter-skelter just because we want them. There needs to be a good purpose. If we want God's blessing on something, we need to have, listen carefully, a Bible reason for doing it. Are you getting my drift? What we do must come out of the principles of the Word of God. They must be governed by the standards of God, not ours. And so Solomon says this, he states his purpose in verse 4 to 5. Behold, I build a house to the name of the Lord my God to dedicate it to him. Aha, purpose. The house that I'm building, it's going to be dedicated to the Lord. And to burn before him sweet incense. And for the continual showbread. And for the burnt offerings, morning and evening, on the Sabbaths, and on the new moons, and on the solemn feasts of the Lord our God. This is an ordinance forever to Israel. Verse 5. And the house which I build is great. Now I say, well, why, why not just a simple little shack? Purpose. Watch the purpose. Why was that house going to be great? Why? For great is our God above all gods. And Solomon said, I'm going to make this house reflect the character of our God. And so he didn't put together some two by four shed and say, this is the place of our tabernacle. He built it because God is great. How long did it take to build? 20 years. 1 Kings chapter 9 and verse 10. And it came to pass at the end of 20 years when Solomon had built the two houses, the house of the Lord and the king's house. 2 Chronicles 5.1 says, Thus all the work that Solomon made for the house of the Lord was finished. And Solomon brought in all the things that David his father had dedicated, the silver and the gold and all the instruments put he among the treasures of the house of God. So there is the completion of this house. And it's a wonderful thing. Could, uh, for those of you who were around when we completed building our house here after 11 months, uh, there was great rejoicing. And we had about 400 people come to our dedication service. It was a wonderful thing, not only for us within the, the church, but a wonderful thing for the community as well. Finally, they're rid of that hole that was on the corner of Main and Stevenson Street. There was now a great assembly brought together by Solomon. He and the people, turn to chapter number 5, 2 Chronicles, verses 2 through 7. It says, Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel, and all the heads of the tribe, the chief of the fathers of the children of Israel under Jerusalem, to bring up the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is in Zion. Wherefore all the men of Israel assembled themselves unto the king in the feast which was in the seventh month. 
And all the elders of Israel came and the Levites took up the ark and they brought up the ark in the tabernacle of the congregation. And all the holy vessels that were in the tabernacle, these did the priests and the Levites bring up. Verse 6 especially, the first part. Also King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel that were assembled unto him before the ark sacrificed sheep and oxen which could not be told nor numbered for multitude. Was this a big event? The answer is affirmative. It was. It was huge. The priests brought in the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord unto his place, into the Holy of Holies, if you will, to the oracle of the house and the most holy place, even under the wings of the cherubim. They knew where it belonged. They placed it there. And the placing of the Ark under the cherubim, under their wings, and the worshipful music that played without, without, it all added majesty to the event, resulting in the glory of the Lord filling the tabernacle, filling the temple, so much so that if we read in verse number 14, 2 Chronicles chapter 5, the priests could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud, Shekinah glory of God, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. What an event. How could they not be filled with love for the Lord, with worship? How could they not be revived at this particular time? The next thing, if you turn to chapter 6, 2 Chronicles, verse number 13. Solomon built a platform of brass from which he would then offer prayer. Verse 13 says, For Solomon had made a brazen scaffold. He, he didn't do that in five minutes, okay? He didn't go to the Home Depot and pick up some pressure-treated wood and come back and get a couple of nails and a couple of spikes and put the thing together. This was in his plans. He had built this altar. He had built this place, this scaffolding that he could go on. We find the dimensions. It was five cubits long, five cubits broad, and three cubits high. He had set it in the midst of the court. So here it is, outside of the temple. And upon it he stood, but he didn't just stand. He, the king of Israel, goes to his knees. And he begins to pray. And he prays before all the congregation. And he spreads forth his hands toward heaven. He lifts up holy hands, if you will. And he begins to pray. What does he do by this action? He assumes a position of humility. He's the king. And here's the king bowing down and praying. Could you imagine what it would be like if our president contacted by video conference all of the leaders of the world and had he erected a place like this and he said, I want all as would participate, bow with me. And if he would get down upon his knees and bow his head to the platform and cry out for mercy to a loving and kind God. Well, I know some people out there would say he's, he's crazier than we think he is. But it would be the position of humility before the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Do I expect that to happen? I pray it would. Especially as we get to the end of this message. But do I expect that there are some people even listening right now via Facebook or who will listen in the future? That will even in, in their own homes and the privacy of their bedroom, that they will bow a knee and trust Christ as their Savior? I pray they would. But I know that broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many there be that go in there at. He assumes a position of humility. He kneeled down upon his knees before all the congregation of Israel. 
He wasn't thinking about his political future, his legacy. He wasn't thinking about his next election. He was leading as the monarch who feared God. Above all things, he feared him. And who does he address? He addresses in his humility the God of heaven. For it says, he spread forth his hands toward heaven and said, O oh Lord God of Israel, that we would do such a thing. There's the occasion that leads us up to chapter 6. When we go to chapter number 6, please turn there if you will. If you would take the time to read the chapter in its entirety now, so we know the occasion is that Solomon has assumed the throne. He has a desire to build a temple. He takes him 20 years to build the temple and, the tab and in the tabernacle, the tent, we find that there is the ark of God uh, until the temple is being built. And all the instruments, all the utensils, everything that David had prepared, that is all there and it's waiting and it's waiting to be used and Solomon now has reigned for 20 years and the temple is built. And the dedicatory service is taking place. Now we come to chapter 6. I want you to, if you have a pen or if you have a pencil, or whatever you use to mark your Bible, I want you to get it out. Because I want you to connect some dots. Because they're very important for us to connect these dots. I want you to connect the ifs and the thens that are found in chapter number 6 and chapter number 7. There are the ifs, first of all, of Solomon's prayer representing the negatives of Israel's condition should they happen. They're found in these following verses. Watch with me, if you will. Chapter 6 and verse number 22. If a man sin against his neighbor. Do you see that? I'm not going to go into some of the details, other details that are given. I'm interested in the if. The if is a conditional statement. If this happens. If it happens. Here is personal sin. Do people engage in personal sin? The answer is yes. We don't want to call things sin anymore, but God calls things sin. God doesn't have an opinion. He has a statement. God declares truth, not error, not a maybe it is, maybe it isn't. God has no gray areas. God has black and white. Here is Solomon understanding that, and when he understands that, he is saying, upon the condition when a man sins, and here it is a sin against his neighbor. Now, you can think of a bunch of sins that neighbors do to one another. By the way, you should also think about what Jesus says about neighbors. Who is my neighbor? It's not just the guy that lives next to me. It's not just the house next to me. It's not the house across the street. You can't put a distance on it. Understand? So we need to consider this. Uh, do I have any neighbors in my own house? How about my wife? How about your husband? How about children? How about parents? Neighbors has a bigger connotation than just the guy that lives next to you. And there's sin that goes on there. Uh, is there jealousy between neighbors? Is there adultery that goes on between neighbors? Is there cheating that goes on between neighbors? Do neighbors steal each other's property, each other's things? Do they say bad things about each other? Evil speaking? If a neighbor sin against a neighbor, that's number one. Verse 24 is another. And if thy people, Israel, be put to the worst before the enemy... Because they have sinned against thee. So here there is national sin. And he is saying if it should happen. That there is war that breaks out. Not because we've just upset another nation. 
But here he defines it even more because we have sinned against you, God. If that happens, if this condition arises, 26, verse 26. When the heaven is shut up, now watch that there's a couple of things coming up here. And there is no rain because they have sinned against thee. National sin causing or creating a natural disaster. Here, it's drought. So if the circumstances should indicate to us that because we have sinned, Lord, you've turned off the spigot of heaven and there is no rain. If that is taking place, you'll notice that, that Solomon is linking personal sin, national sin to things that are going wrong. And with introspection, we say, wow, maybe we should think about this a little bit more. And maybe we should reorder what we're doing. In verse 28, there's another one. I'm sorry, verse 26. The when, that's an if. Okay. In verse 28, if there be dearth in the land, if there be pestilence, if there be blasting, or mildew, or locust, or caterpillar, if their enemies besiege them in the cities of their land, whatsoever sore or whatsoever sickness there be, here are more conditions. And they're in the land because of national sin. Let me run down the list one more time that Solomon is thinking about. And by the way, what did Solomon ask for when God said, I'm going to give you anything you want, ask me. He said, give me wisdom and give me understanding. Give me knowledge. In Solomon's great wisdom and in Solomon's great knowledge that God had granted to him, he is making a link between personal and national sin and things that seem to be so disastrous. And he's calling people to think about these things. Let me list them. A, drought, no rain. B, dearth, that will be famine and hunger. C, pestilence, that's plague. It's interesting, if you look up this word in the, in, in the uh, ancient languages, I mean, you're going back in Hebrew a long way back, Back to the pictographs. You'll find out that it describes uh, in the ancient language a reordering of the population through plague. Interesting for the times we live in, isn't it? There's blasting. That would be D. That is blight upon the crops. Or there's mildew, literally a jaundice, say, uh, a paleness, a rust in grain due to a fungus. If there's locusts, as they come in swarms, devouring everything that is in their path, and caterpillars, that's the embryonic state of the, uh, of the locust. Uh, it's a stage where they eat everything in their path. Wow. H is enemies, both personal and national. If you will look in this passage of scripture, you'll find in chapter six, verse 32, that this warning, that this prayer is going beyond Israel. Now, why am I bringing this up? It's because that sometimes people read the Old Testament and they say, well, that is exclusively for Israel and the church should not consider the promises or the warnings because they're exclusively to Israel. Well, I want to declare to you that Solomon considered people beyond Israel because he says the stranger in verse 32 and with verse 34 and with verse number 36, the person that is not Jewish, Solomon is praying ifs for. And verse number 32, here's what he says, moreover concerning the stranger, which is not of thy people Israel, that would be people like you and me, non-Jews. So it includes us. Uh, his prayer is including all people for all time. 
And verse number 37, yet if they bethink themselves, that's including Jew and Gentile. That's an interesting word, if they will bethink themselves. Now, how many times have you used that in a sentence this week? But you have, may have used it, the thought, or you may have used the definition in some other way. Well, what does it mean? That is, if they will look deeply into themselves, examine themselves, if they will go back and they will consider what they have done, their thoughts, their actions, which God already knows about. See, we can't hide a thing from him. And so Solomon is saying, if they do this self-examination and they go deep into their heart, if they will do this, it's an if. I don't know how many of us in this generation that we live in are willing to go that deeply into our personal life and consider that God in heaven already knows absolutely everything about you. And that he is asking us to come into a parallel orbit with him and confess our sin. That we could be right there understanding what he is saying and understanding what we are. And that we could examine ourselves, examine our hearts, examine our being so that we can be aligned with him. Not just some other Christian. You know, I could find a person who calls himself a Christian that is engaged in just about any sin that God condemns in the world and I can align myself with that person and justify my actions to be like them. But what I want you to think about is I need to bring myself in alignment to, with God. I need to bring myself in alignment with his word. I don't need to be making the word of God time sensitive. I don't need to be saying, well, the Bible was written to an ancient people long ago who had a lot of superstition and a lot of tradition, and so therefore it is irrelevant to the day that we live in. That's the mindset of a lot of people. But it's not the mindset of God. He is alive. God is as relevant today as he was 2,000 years ago. He's as relevant today as he was when he created this old world. He is more relevant to the lives of people in times like this than you could ever think. There is a God in heaven who knows all things. It is up to me to bring myself in alignment with him, not the other way around. And that's what people do. Read chapter 1 of Romans. People are constantly trying to bring, them, bring God in alignment with what they want to believe about him. All right. That were the negative ifs. The opposite side of the negative ifs are the thens. If I discover this about myself, if I discover this about my nation, if this is true, then, Lord. Let's go back. Chapter 6, verse 26. Chapter 6 and verse 26 says, when the heaven is shut up and there is no rain because they have sinned against thee, yet if, this is a positive if, if they pray toward this place and confess thy name and turn from their sin, when thou dost afflict them. Ha ha. So Solomon is looking out into the future and he is saying, Lord, if they examine themselves and they see their sin, and then they pray, if they pray, if they confess their sin, if then, and, and I'm only going there, I'm not giving you the end result yet, if there is drought and dearth and pestilence and blight and mildew and locust and caterpillar, verse 29, same chapter, then, see verse 29? Then what prayer or what supplication soever shall be made of any man or of all thy people Israel when everyone shall know his own sore and his own grief. 
and shall spread forth his hands in his house. So now, here's mankind, he says, and they're not saying, hey, that's your problem, it's not mine. They're looking at themselves and they're saying, hey, I have this problem, I have this trouble. If, in a positive way, that happens. If the stranger comes, in verse 32, and prays, if he comes, if war breaks out, if they search, now watch, then hear and glorify your name. Verse 33. Then God please hear. So when a genuine, an authentic, that's a big word thrown out today, examination of self takes place, and people understand that there is something that is happening to them and it stems from their behavior, their sin against the holy God. And they pray. If they pray, then, Lord, hear from heaven. Then. If they search their inner being, verse 37. If they find fault there. If they confess their sin. If they turn around and go back to you. That's repentance. Then, verse 39. Hear. And grant them their desire and forgive their sin. What a precious promise that is. Here is a God who is telling us through Solomon. If you'll examine yourself. I want to do something about this situation that you're in. For you personally. And ultimately nationally. Now the end of Solomon's prayer was dramatically accentuated. Solomon's final plea. Chapter 6 verses 40 to 42. Now, my God, let I beseech thee, thine eye be opened, and let thy ears be attent to the prayer that is made in this place. Now, therefore, arise, O Lord God, into thy resting place, thou in the ark of thy strength, and let thy priests, O Lord God, be clothed with salvation, and let thy saints rejoice in goodness. O Lord God, not, turn not away the face of thine anointed. Remember the mercies of David thy servant. That's his final plea. Once again, can I imagine for a moment that the leaders of the world are on their knees pleading with God at this particular time. Of all the countries of the world, because there are some things that have taken place that they're telling us are unprecedented in this life. And they fall upon their face as the leaders of the world and plead with the holy God. What's God's response? Well, first of all, in chapter 7, in verse 1. Now, when Solomon had made an end of praying, look what God does. God gives them an exclamation point. The fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the house. What a response! God assures Solomon of, of an answer to prayer. In chapter 7 and verse 12, And the Lord appeared unto Solomon, comes to him by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer. Now none of this is going on. None of the things that, that Solomon describes were happening. They were good times. The temple is being dedicated. The fire of God has fallen upon the temple. None of the things that he suggested were happening. And God says, I've heard your prayer, and I have chosen this place to myself for a house of sacrifice. And then God begins to give the negative ifs. Let me just rehearse them for you. They're found in verses 12, 13, and ultimately coming into verse 14 of chapter 7. If there be drought, if there be locust, if there be plague, if my people. So Solomon, I have heard what you've said. And of all the things that you have mentioned, if those things happen, if I have sent them to you, so there's got to be a distinguishing between chastisement that the Lord sends and the natural things that this old world of sin produces on itself. 
if there is drought, if there is locust, if there is plague, if my people, if my people, far beyond the Jewish nation, for those of us who know Christ as our Savior, we are his children. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. 1 John 3, 1. If we will humble our, ourselves, that is, to be subdued or brought low or to bring ourselves under subjection to the Lord, if we will pray, if we will meditate, if we will intercede as when one is in distress, if we will seek God's face, that is, seek the Lord's presence, His will, and His word, if we will turn our back from our wicked on our wickedness to a place of submission to God. Those are God's ifs too. And God has some thens. Then will I hear from heaven. Isn't that what we want? Then will I forgive their sin. Isn't that what we want? Then will I heal their land. Does our land need some healing? It sure does. There's a lot of personal sin going on. There's a lot of national sin. It comes right down to our communities. We find that there are some decisions governmentally that are absolutely against God's word. There are some personal things that people are saying that are absolutely against God's word. The lust, the sodomy, the murder, all of these particular things are a black eye against us. God, who is the creator of all things, has a position. He's never changed it. He never will. We need to take a look at ourselves as a nation and as individuals. God knows what we have done. Am I aware that I as an individual, that we as a nation have violated a great deal of the word of God. If I can have that understanding, then according to what we have read, I need to bethink myself. In other words, I need to examine myself and think deeply into my roots of who I am and what I am. And if I find that I have violated the word of God, then I need to do something about it. Here's the wonderful promise. If you, God says, if you do this, then I will. There's comfort. God is really willing and waiting for me to turn, acknowledge him, submit to his will. If you're without Christ as your savior, here's what you need. The Bible says, except a man is born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. The Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You were shapen in sin and iniquity. The Bible says that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Will you as a sinner take God in his word, confess your sin, confess your fault, confess your wickedness and evil, and ask the Lord Jesus Christ to forgive you? The promise is this. If you will confess, he will hear. He will forgive your sin. Christian, do we need to be upon our knees pleading with our Heavenly Father? Think about some things. Do some introspection. Ask God, what is there in me that is not right with you? I'll do the same. May God bless us all. Father, thank you for the time. I pray that you'll minister to our hearts. I pray that people will come to Christ and that someone might be saved. Above all, we pray for our land. I pray it will be healed. In Jesus' name, amen. <music>